Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Pride can manifest itself in many different ways. For example, pride, usually people think of someone who is arrogant, someone who is selfish, and someone who wants always their way. Another form of pride is when someone is highly insecure. For example, someone might ask them to, to lead a group, to get involved, to do something, and they want to do it, but they're worried, they're concerned. If they don't measure up, if they don't succeed, what will people think about this individual? So because of that fear, they say no. And it's a fear of failing that's rooted in a type of inverted pride. And there's a third type of pride. And it's this type that's most relevant for our study. And that is when someone simply believes that they are always right. Now, they may want to legitimately help someone. They may not be selfish. They may have the best motivations to bless someone. But they are so sure that their way is the right way. And they are very stubborn in making any changes because they truly believe they know what's best. Now, we're going to be speaking about the disciples and in this passage of scripture we're going to see that the disciples they had that third form of pride that they believed that they knew better than Messiah who's Messiah he is the son of God he is the creator according to Colossians chapter 1 he is the creator of all things and all things are held together by him it is extremely prideful to think that we know better. And we're going to see in an undeniable way that these disciples, they were not trusting in Messiah. So let me ask you a question. Are you someone that demonstrates trust in Messiah? How do you do that? By relying not upon your own perspective, but trusting in his word what he said and believe this the word of god all of the word of god from the book of genesis to the book of revelation it is perfect revelation from god it doesn't matter what time period that we're in whether it was a thousand years ago or today his truth is just that truth from god and a wise person a humble person will apply his word to their life and implement what the scripture commands us to do. I think for a moment about Moses. The scripture says that Moses was the most humble of all individuals. And that's why he was the servant of God. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 14. The book of Matthew and chapter 14. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Hopefully you recall that there was a reference to John the Baptist. That John, we recall that because of his faithfulness to the law of God, because of his commitment to the marriage covenant, John was put to death. He was beheaded. And we know at the end of our study, that his disciples came and they buried him. And Yeshua heard of this. So again, Matthew chapter 14 and verse 13. And Yeshua, having heard, he withdrew from there in a boat 
two and pay very close attention. I want to translate this very carefully. It says to a desert place, not a deserted place, although it was that. But the word that's used here to describe this location is a desert. Now, sometimes that same word can be translated as a wilderness. And what it speaks of is a place that is very barren, it is empty, and there's nothing there. It does not sustain life. It is the same word, of course, this is Greek, but it's the same word when the children of Israel, because of their lack of faith, because they would not implement the instructions of God, because of that, what happened? They did not enter into the land a promise. They didn't receive those promises. They didn't experience the good land. They were left in that desert, that wilderness, that barren, empty place for 40 years until that disobedient, that faithless generation died out. And that's what happens when we rely upon our own understanding. When we think our perspective is the right perspective rather than listening and obeying God. As I said, we're going to see the disciples. They didn't realize. They didn't demonstrate. They didn't manifest in their words or actions their faith in their master, the very son of God, the anointed one, Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus Christ. So he withdraws, he travels by boat, and it says he is in this desert place, and then it says by himself. And the crowd, having heard, they followed after him. And this crowd, once again, it's in the plural. There were many different groups following him. And this says something. You see, the scripture would have us to know that these individuals, this crowd, they knew of Messiah, who he was. They had heard him teach over and over. And everyone, and I mean just that, everyone knew of John the Baptist. They heard of what had happened to him, and they knew that Yeshua withdrew immediately after when we look at the text, we see the connection between that event and him withdrawing. And what did these crowds do? They went out unto him. And what's significant? He wasn't in a popular place. He wasn't easily able to be accessed. He was by himself in the desert. But nevertheless, these crowds, they went out to him. And they traveled, notice what it says, by foot from the cities. Verse 14. And Yeshua went out, and notice what it says. He saw. He saw the great crowd. And notice, he saw them. And this is a word of, of understanding. It's seeing, perceiving something, understanding it in the right way and the scripture says that because of this because this next word for being moved with compassion it's in the passive meaning this Yeshua was caused by something to have compassion for these large groups of people and I believe what it is is that they had interest in him they sought him out they wanted to be in his presence. And why? What was he primarily doing? Well, yes, and we'll see this once more. He was a miracle worker. He healed. But here's the key. By and large, what the scripture emphasizes is not his healings, his miracles, but his teaching. And when we look at this event that we're coming to, and what event is that? The only miracle, and I'm not speaking about the resurrection, but the only miracle that Yeshua did that is recorded in all four Gospels. And what is that? The feeding of the 5,000. 
And what the scripture teaches us is this. These individuals, they went to him and he taught. In the other gospels, he taught for quite an extended period of time. The hours went past and no one left. No one was concerned about anything other than hearing him. And let me share with you, that is wisdom. The best way that you can utilize your time is in the Word of God. You might say that you have a very busy life. You have numerous obligations, commitments that you have to keep. Maybe so. But studying the Word of God will make your life more efficient. You will have better time management in the Word of God for other things than if you set aside the Word of God and just concentrate it on the physical things. Don't be deceived. Don't be misled. Don't be an individual that does not realize that it is a biblical requirement. If we have faith in God, we're going to emphasize the Word of God, scriptural revelation. So these people went out. They listened to him teach. And notice what the scripture says. He was moved by compassion for them. And what did he do? He healed their sick. Now, this is a word of restoration. It is a word of putting things, and here's the key, putting things in order. Ask yourself this question. Do I want a godly order to my life? Now, many people might flippantly say, yes, I do. But do you really? Because if you do, you are going to be someone who is a diligent student of the Word of God. I'm reminded of this very well-known prayer in Judaism called the Shema. It's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6 where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then we have that commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what's interesting, it emphasizes the commandments, but the first commandment that it speaks to is to teach your children diligently the Word of God. And that is good advice, not just to teach your children and invest in that generation, but learn yourself the Word of God. That shows, that demonstrates a love of God. So when we do that, what's going to be the outcome of that? Learning, studying diligently the Word of God is going to bring a godly order into your life. Things get out of order. You need change. And the Word of God is a catalyst for bringing a righteous change into your life. A change that's going to give you a godly testimony and reveal to other God's glory through your behavior. They're going to see God's leadership in your life. So he healed their sick. Verse 15. Now, verse 15 is a very interesting verse because it forms a conjunction with what we've been studying, but it's a unique conjunction. It shows kind of a disconnect, and the disconnect is among the disciples. They know that they are in a place which is a desert that's barren, but they don't understand the significance of it. Why were the children of Israel in that desert, that wilderness, 40 years? Because they would not, and I choose my words carefully, they would not trust in the Lord. They did not rely upon Him. They thought their way was the right way. And they were constantly trying to get God to do what they wanted. That is prideful, it is foolishness, and it leads to an empty, a lack of a life of lacking and an absence of God's activity in your situation. So notice what it says, verse 15. It begins with but. That's that conjunction of discontinuity. The disciples did not gain from this what they should. It says, but becoming 
evening. And it means just that. We're not talking about dusk. We're not talking about late in the afternoon when the sun is still shining. But the word here implies evening, really evening. That, that darkness was coming. So notice what we read. And evening was coming, and his disciples came to him and paid very close attention to what the disciples were saying. This passage of Scripture is teaching us how not to be a disciple. We need to be individuals that understand that we have to show, demonstrate dependence upon him. That we rely not upon ourselves, not on our vantage point, but on his instructions. Here, the disciples did not do this. Notice what they said. They came to him as evening was at hand. And they said, this place is a desert place. It's a wilderness. It's a barren. Now realize something. Yeshua went out with purpose to this place. He traveled by boat. He withdrew himself from where he was in order to arrive at this location. So it is silly to tell him, do you know where you are? Do you know that this is a desert that we're in and all these people are here with us? So they say to him, a desert place is this. And the hour is already, and if your Bible says late, they didn't translate it properly. This is a word, when we look at it very carefully, it means to go by, to pass. And what they're saying is the hour, and the implication is this. The hour for their departure, from their standpoint, what they believe, how they saw things, that hour had already come and went. The time for them to be there had passed. They should have left long before. So we read, and the hour has already passed. Second part of verse 15. Now, Greek oftentimes has a root verb, and then they attach a prefix to it. And here we're going to see the prefix, the same one, repeated three times. And it's the prefix or preposition from. It's the preposition from that's used as a prefix to, to these verbs. Pay very close attention. They say to Yeshua, send away the crowd. Literally, send from, meaning from this place, the crowd. Why? In order that they go away. What's that word away? From. So send them from this place that they might go from, from this place, into the villages to buy for themselves food. Now, what's on their minds? Well, it's late. We see this in the other Gospels. It's account of this same miracle that they had been there for a long time and they had eaten nothing and no one was complaining. No one was complaining, but who? The disciples. And they had pretty much had enough of that. They didn't want any more teaching. They wanted everyone to go away so they could eat. Now, they weren't trusting him. They were focusing upon themselves, their need to eat. They put the physical above the spiritual. No one else was, just this disciples so that they might go away into the villages to buy for themselves food, verse 16. And we see that same conjunction which shows a disconnect, something in conflict, in contrast. Yeshua, he brought them to this place. They were there for a reason. And that's why he says, verse 16, but, now I realize many Bibles may say and, but it's, better translated to show this contrast with the word but. But Yeshua said to them, and notice what he says, they have no 
need to leave. And this word leave means to go from, to depart from this place. And this is the fourth time, different verse, but in this section, the fourth time this word from, this preposition is used. He's saying, you're saying, we need to go from here, from this place, away from here. And he's saying, from my perspective, whose perspective? God's perspective. There's no reason to leave from here. He has a totally different objective. And my question is this. Is that what's going on in your life? That you have one perspective and you're praying one way, but God has something totally different. And you're going like this. Stop. Listen to his word. Seek his revelation for your life in scripture. If you do that, there is going to be a glorious change. Now, will you have problems? You may even have more problems, but you know what you'll also experience? The joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is strength. And you will have the privilege of overcoming these things, being a testimony, and people are going to know. Yeah, they have problems, but they overcome. They don't become discouraged. They don't lose heart. They don't complain. Never complain. They don't complain. But they trust. They rely. They depend upon God. And God, just like David says in the Psalms, God delivers them from their problems. So Yeshua says they have no need to go away. And then look at the end of verse 16 where it says, you, and this is emphasized, you give to them to eat. So they're in this desert, this barren place. There's nothing there. He says, you're thinking about food, their need of food. Therefore, you give them something to eat. Verse 17. But they didn't like it. In contrast to that, they said, but they were saying to him, we do not have here. And this is emphatic. That word's going to repeat again in also an emphasized way. Read once more. We do not have here anything except five loaves and two fish. Verse 18. And he said, in contrast, that same word, but he said, bring to me them here. Now that's what's emphasize once more they're saying let's go away there's nothing here we cannot meet the need of the people but if you are intimate with messiah you greatly understand his perspective his purposes you are going to see that he will miraculously supply so that you can minister to others that you can be a blessing in someone else's life that you can do the impossible so don't rely upon yourself. Rely upon his provision. So we read, he says to them, bring to me them here, verse 19. And he commanded the crowd to recline upon the grass. Now that word reclining is an important word. It doesn't just mean to sit but usually it's used in regard to a special meal, like a holiday meal, something that is of, of significance. So that use of that word tells us something important is going to happen. We're going to see God at work. And that should be what motivates us, what we desire, God at work in our situations. But we have to depend upon him. We have to trust him. And we just don't say, God, I trust you and believe that that's going to make a difference. We demonstrate that trust by studying his word. Because the trust is evident when we learn a biblical principle and we implement that into our life. So he says in this passage, for the crowd, he commands them to sit or recline upon the grass. Second part of verse 19. And taking the five loaves, these five loaves of bread, and the two fish, he looks up into the heavens. And what does he do? 
he blesses. Now, this term bless means to say something good, specifically something good about God. God, you're able. God, all things are possible with you. But in the Hebrew language, this is Greek, but in the Hebrew language, the word bless comes from bringing that which is in heaven to earth. So it's a heavenly provision. And that is supernatural. Now, it might be something that's physical, natural, but the means of its arrival, they're going to eat fish and loaves. But the means that they received it were supernatural. Why? Notice the scripture. He looks up, raises his eyes to the heaven. He blesses and he breaks. That is, he divides and he gave to the disciple the loaves and the disciples to the crowd. And notice the outcome of this. No one would have believed this. Where were they? They were in the desert, a barren place, an empty place. But they all ate, and here's what I like. They all ate, and they were satisfied. Now, that satisfaction is rooted in an acknowledgement of God's provision. If you are a recipient of what God gives, you will be satisfied. And that word satisfaction also relates to joy and confidence. So all ate and they were satisfied. And they lifted up, they took up the excess, that which is in abundance. And notice what it says. They took up the abundance of fragments. And what was there? There were 12 baskets full and the ones that ate they were men approximately 5,000 in addition not including women and children 5,000 ate and that number 5,000 is related to liberty it's related to freedom it is related to being in God's will where there's no restrictions and the purposes of God can be fulfilled in your life. Well, we'll talk more about that word, that number 5,000, as we move on next week into the remaining passages of this chapter. Until then, may God richly bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.